There was this idea, of course, that we needed to return to the ideals and the ambitions uh, of the founders of the state. And I thought there was much of merit in that idea, particularly in, in relation to the idea of public service, in relation to the idea of uh, an integrity we associate with that generation, in relation to the idea that they were not prepared, that generation, that revolutionary generation, they were not always prepared uh, to, to urge others to take risks they were not themselves uh, prepared uh, to take. But at the same time, we could also simplify what was a complex generation uh, by reading too much into that. The idea that they were unsullied in any way, the idea that they didn't need to be contextualized as belonging to that Victorian generation. We did need to interrogate uh, that idea of the ideals and the ambitions of the founders uh, of the state as if those ideals uh, and ambitions were never tarnished or were never compromised in any way. Of course, they were in so many different ways. But you do have to allow uh, for, of course, that, uh, that generation's integrity also. But sometimes this idea of invoking the ghosts for the purposes of the present was just taken too far. You could see it year after year in relation to commemorating Michael Collins, for example, uh, at the annual Bail of Law uh, orations. David Putman, the British film producer who gave one of these orations, suggested accurately, I think, that the life of Collins was a one, uh, was a life suspended somewhere between myth uh, and history. And you could see that myth, I think, took precedence a lot of the time over history. Michael Noonan, for example, our current Minister for Finance in 2001, uh, when he was leader of Fianna Gael, uh, referred uh, to Michael Collins in glowing terms. No one else, he suggested at Bail and Law, did more to ensure the maintenance of public order and the security of life, personal liberty and property. And that was a reference to the Director of Intelligence of the IRA uh, during the War of Independence. In 2006, the current Taoiseach Ganda Kenny, uh, as leader of Fine Gael, referred to Michael Collins as the brilliant West Cork genius, the one-man revolution who brought a British empire to its knees. And again, you can see the extent to which hyperbole uh, will flourish on these occasions. There was also a Collins 22 society that was established with the purpose, the very commendable purposes, of ensuring that a statue was erected to commemorate the 100th anniversary uh, of the killing of Michael Collins at Bail and Law uh, in 1922. And I found the website of the Collins 22 Society to be hugely illuminating uh, about the mix of history, uh, myth, uh, commemoration and memory. Michael Collins, it was asserted at this time, uh, around 2007, 2008, would make common cause with the hard-pressed mortgage holders, with those who were suffering under a rake of stealth, stealth taxes. The idea that Michael Collins would not have stood for this at all. Michael Collins becomes the consumer, consumer champion, a kind of an early 20th century Eddie Hobbs, if you will. Uh, and again, we can see the degree uh, to which uh, history in inverted commas, can be invoked in order to sell that particular uh, contemporary message. So we did have that use also uh, of, of the invoking uh, of the ghosts. But I don't want to end on uh, a negative or a cynical note. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the importance uh, of, of the release of archival material, that commemoration can result in new perspectives and new information and a heightened awareness and understanding of that generation on their own terms through the prism uh, of 1916 uh, and onwards. If you think of all of the uh, archival material that has been released in recent years, there's a strong sense that it is giving us a history from below. That's not to um, undermine the importance of, of, of leadership or to undermine uh, our, our national leadership or those who assume those kind of national positions. But it is a reminder, of course, that ultimately this was a revolution that was propelled uh, by those um, at the grassroots level. We get a strong sense of the range of lived experience through personal testimony uh, in particular. There was an interesting project in Trinity College Dublin, uh, which started in Trinity, Co Trinity College Dublin called Letters of 1916. The idea was that they would ask members of the public to send in contemporary correspondence if they had it within their family about life in 1916. Uh, and the great thing about digitization now, of course, is that this material can be taken and digitized and then returned uh, to the owner. And there was an interview uh, by an elderly gentleman around the time of the launch of this project who referred to correspondence between his parents, who were a courting couple uh, in 1916. And he was asked by the journalist, what side were they on in 1916? And he replied, they weren't on any side. 
1916. They were on the getting on with life side in 1916, a reminder, of course, that there were those who were trying to get on uh, with life uh, who were not active combatants. Uh, and you will always, of course, um, I think, underestimate the extent to which those uh, will try and get on with things during a period of upheaval like that. As Dave Fitzpatrick pointed out as far back as 1977, uh, there was always hay to be saved, cows to be milked, and women to be ordered about uh, during the revolutionary period. Some of that material also, I suppose, invites us to challenge the notion of historical inevitability. That these things aren't preordained, that you do need to be aware and conscious of the nuances and the idea that things could have turned out differently. This has often involved the invoking of the legacy and the memory of John Redmond in relation to what supposedly he had achieved by 1914 with Home Rule uh, on the statute books. And again, this can be exaggerated. Home Rule, uh, in the words of historian Alvin Jackson, even if it had been implemented, it might have involved a short-term political triumph, but at the expense, uh, but at the price of a delayed apocalypse in relation to a civil war uh, between uh, North and South, between Unionists uh, and Republicans or Nationalists. So we have to be careful sometimes with how far we can take uh, that particular type of speculative history, but there's no harm in asking those questions, uh, of course. We also are getting a much more nuanced sense of what was involved in loyalty in Ireland 100 years ago. How do you define loyalty in Ireland 100 years ago? Well, again, let's define it through the prism of that era. What did that generation have to say about loyalty insofar as we can ascertain that? There were three brothers, for example, from Waterford, Redmond Territory, uh, who were enlisting for British Army service as Irish men. Uh, in 1915, and they were interviewed by a journalist with the Irish Times. And the journalist asked them why they were enlisting. They were all married. They were all leaving secure employment to join the British Army. And their response was that Mr. John Redmond said that this is as much Ireland's war as England's war, and we want to fight for Ireland. So we have to look at that contemporary uh, testimony or those contemporary perspectives uh, to get an idea uh, of how they might have def uh, defined loyalty. Of course, others defined it in a very, very different way, and we have no shortage of that testimony uh, either. We also have a lot more concrete information about who was where, when, and why. We know, for example, from an enormous archival project, the Military Service Pensions uh, Collection, we know how many people mobilized in 1916. The Military Service Pension Collection is the most voluminous archive of this period. This, without getting into the technical details, this was a process that was begun in the 1920s to compensate those who had suffered or been bereaved as a result uh, of the uh, revolutionary period or those who had earned pensions as a result of their military service. And there's a whole succession of legislation from the 1920s onwards to broaden the net uh, in relation to who uh, might be able to apply uh, for a military service pension. It's an archive of in the region of 300,000 files, uh, huge administrative files, but also the personal testimony of the applicants. That doesn't mean there were 300,000 applicants, but the personal testimony in relation to what they had done. They had to account for their every move. The bar was set very high. There was a huge degree of disappointment. And it's a heartbreaking archive because of the poverty, because of the disillusionment, because of the suffering that is so apparent in it. And because you can only conclude that there was a very definite hierarchy of benefit, a hierarchy of victimhood in relation to the 1916 Rising and what happened afterwards. This archive is a chronicle of great disappointment because so many who applied were refused. W.T. Cosgrave as president of the Executive Council, leader of government in the 1920s, insisted that the bar would be set high when it came to the award of military service pensions, and successive governments kept to their word in, in relation to that. By 1960, 66,300 veterans had applied for a military service pension, but only 15,700 were awarded those pensions. So you can see the discrepancy between those two figures, 66,000 uh, applications, but just under 16,000 were successful, a huge chronicle uh, of disappointment. And yet we do start to get the nuts and bolts of the brigades, of who was where, for how long, and when. 